what was more fearful if I, is um, when I actually had some success as an athlete in CrossFit, starting to get recognized and getting a, like sponsorships. And when I got those, I lived in, I, I did not enjoy being an athlete anymore. I lived in fear of being exposed. I thought that like I wasn't as good as I was being recognized for hmm. and someone's going to figure out that I'm not that good at this. Yeah. And that was a a not fun period in my life. Um when I was be when I was being successful as an athlete was not a fun time. We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run, always chasing, never stopping. Hello, Ben. Hey, Patrick. Today we are going to talk about uh, a very broad but interesting subject, uh, and that is fear. Living with fear, dealing with fear, uh, how to maybe not overcome it, but live with it. Uh, to the degree that one needs to. Um, and so I kind of wanted to dive in first with just like a really broad uh, sense from you on how your uh, how your thinking about or around fear has changed from maybe from when you were younger to now. Um, what does it look like sort of just generally sort of in your life? What kind of role has it played, you know, over the last, I don't know, 10, 20 years? Hmm. Um, I think I've come to... Uh, slightly understand what fear is, which changed my perception of why it, it it's a part of our lives. I think when I was younger, it was just this um, this thing I had no control over. Um, it, it popped up when uh, you know very un- inopportune times. <laughs> it always does. And, and uh, I frankly, I um, I lived. With, I feel like I lived with a lot of fear. I I, I grew up as very. Um, introverted and a shy person growing up, which might come to a shock for how much I talk now on this podcast. <laughs> but, um, and I was afraid of um, kind of like ridicule or judgment or um, not fitting in. And um, in the last few years, come come to kind of grips on more in terms of like why fear exists in us as human beings and really, you know, as human beings. So, the take I have on it is, and I didn't make this up, and obviously it's it's kind of just um, I've heard from other people, is fear is uh, a part of us for survival mechanisms, right? And it comes from our ancestral past when we were living in caves, and it really stems from two kind of major things. The first one is this fear of like bodily harm, right? Which is we're all sitting around the campfire outside the cave, you know, and um, we hear a twig go snap in the woods and like we snap, like like fear jumps into our bodies. And it's a hormonal response that sends us into this fight or flight stage, which is this sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight. And your heart rate starts racing, your brain, so more oxygen goes to your brain, your pupils dilate, like you're in fear because there might be a saber tooth tiger ready to eat everyone in the tribe. Mm-hmm. There's a second side of fear, which does the same things. It puts you in that same fight or flight state. And it stems from the same survival mechanisms of us in our ancestral past of living in tribes outside caves. But it's not the fear of bodily harm. It's a fear of being ostracized from the group. And what that means is if um, the tribe decides that you're no longer benefiting the group, that you are a hindrance, not a help, if the leader decides that you are a threat to them, that you're going to overtake them, um, or if you um, are not one of us, right? Mm-hmm. If you're an outsider, they kick you out of the tribe and you die again from exposure because you could only last for so long without help from other people um, back in the day. <laughs> so those two things, bodily harm and being ostracized from the group, are what creates fear in us. And in our modern day society, Everything is still an extension of those two things, but th- we don't necessarily have all of those things in place anymore. And the twig going snapping the w- the twig snapping the woods is still there. And it should still be a thing like that's real fear. I might get hurt from this. So when you're standing on top of a cliff and your knees are shaking, your heart is racing, and you get that pit in your stomach, that is your body going into fight or flight. Like, dude, you better make the right decision. Like, this might not be the right thing. That's still very useful for us, like mm-hmm. very, very useful for us. You know, if 
Um, it's adrenaline for a reason. The other one though, about being ostracized from the group is no longer an issue. If you get pushed out from conformity, like you don't have to worry about dying from exposure. In fact, you become original and chances are you'll become more successful if you are not one of us, if you are an outlier, if you are somebody special, if you are different, if you are exceptional, if you are a leader in of your own right. That's where the fear mechanism needs to be flipped upside down. And all the things I feared as a kid, I didn't, I wasn't as scared of like, I, you know, I did all the extreme skiing and mm -hmm. I liked to, I did race car driving for a little bit. And like, you know, it's like that stuff didn't scare me. I enjoyed that. The thing that scared me was being ostracized from the group and not being accepted. I didn't know then what I know now or what I'm beginning to learn now. Yeah. Um, and it's really kind of changed the script on the way I think about fear. So if I'm about to go up to try and jerk the most I've ever jerked in my life, there's a level of fear in there. And I want to pay attention to that. That's actually important. I don't want to be the idiot and be like, it's only 330 pounds. And like, it's just fear and rah, mm -hmm. like F fear, just go for it. It's, that's not the right way to do this. But the fear that we also feel, which is I'm going to be going up against somebody in my class that I normally compete with. Um, man, I have this fear that I might not beat them. That's the fear we have to change. That's when we have to flip. Because that is like, the fear is like, I'm not going to beat them. Okay, does that mean I'm not valued to the group? Does that mean I'm going to be ostracized? Does that mean I'm not going to be belong? Does my importance go away? And it's not that. The, the, the value we have has to reside in something other than that. So just that kind of conceptual understanding of fear has changed the way I look at it. And I look back at my former self, I'm like... You know, I don't. I didn't need to live in that perpetual state of like self judgment and um, fear, mm -hmm. and um, and it's the way I, I kind of operate now. Like, want to do a podcast? Like, yeah. You asked me, like, do I want to do a podcast? I was like, never done before. <laughs> I've never actually never listened to a podcast. Let's do it. Yep. And it's like it's. I'm not afraid of taking those leaps anymore because I understand what the fear, why it's there, and why it's holding me back. And if I can figure out how to um, operate inside of that fear. I have a much better chance of success in the long run. Um, one of the sort of the bigger, if not one of the biggest turning points in your life, I know has been or was when you decided to sort of leave the corporate job you had. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you spent some time sort of figuring out what to do next. Uh, and then which obviously led eventually to CrossFit New England. Mm -hmm. um, was that a big period for you to, to, to wrestle with uh, fear? And if so, um, looking back on it what was the I, I obviously it wasn't the the physical danger fear so it was obviously the ostrac you know yeah. being ostracized but what was what was that period of your life like knowing now that that was a really big turning point for you okay so that was um shortly after 9 11 which was a really um impactful moment in my life a real kind of tipping point a real uh a, a change um i was in my mid-20s early 20s uh didn't have a family didn't really have any responsibilities, didn't have a home, didn't have a mortgage, wasn't tied down to anything. Um, the reason I say that is because I didn't have fear. Mm. I was so motivated to get out of corporate America, um, to get out of a job that I was so dispassionate about and to start something that I was passionate about. Um, it was the exact opposite of fear. I was so excited to be doing this next chapter of my life. If I was to do that now, it'd be very different. I have a lot more riding on that, right? Right. right. And maybe I wouldn't have that. I don't have this big impactful moment, which is like changing my perception of everything like 9-11 did. So I get when people are like leaving their secure jobs to start a business, why there's a lot of fear involved in that. When they're starting anything new, there's a lot of fear involved in that. It just wasn't my story. Mm -hmm. I, I was not um, fearful at all. I was so excited. Yeah. Um, as, we, as I went along that journey, certainly fear crept in along the way. So I go from, it, it also helped that I did these like little tiny baby steps to get to CrossFit New England. So I became um, a personal trainer at Global Gym. I started doing my own business, training people in home. I became a strength and conditioning coach. I started running uh, um, boot camp classes at the facility where I was a strength and conditioning coach. So I built my little business. It was like all these like little micro jumps. Then there was the jump where like, I'm gonna sign a three year lease and put first month, last month security deposit and I'm going to buy, you know, um, you know, tens of thousand dollars worth of equipment. Like mm -hmm. that was the leap. And that's where fear did creep in. Like yeah. 
I'm going to build it. If they don't come, what's happening? At the same time, I had such a strong vision of what I want to create, and I was so passionate about what I was doing. Um, to say, like, it was just this really nice, um, you know, bell-shaped curve of, like, I spent some time in fear, but I spent some time in, like, total bliss, you know, in amazement and, like, excitement. But the, there was this nice kind of, like, middle period was really measured and, like, is you know, following the process and, yep. you know, how am I going to create this? What's the next step? So it, it – as – much as I've um, experienced fear in my life from doing anything from, you know, um, skiing corporate school, Warren Jackson Hole, to like um, starting my own business, to being an awkward middle schooler, um, starting my business was not the most fearful time. Mm, interesting. Um, it was more fearful if I is um, when I actually had some success as an athlete in CrossFit, um, starting to get recognized and getting a, like sponsorships. And when I got those, I lived in, I, I did not enjoy being an athlete anymore. I lived in fear of being exposed. I thought that like I wasn't as good as I was being recognized for hmm. and someone's going to figure out that I'm not that good at this. Yeah. And that was a a not fun period in my life. Um, when I was be, when I was being successful as an athlete was not a fun time because mm -hmm. it was again, me not recognizing of what the fear was. I thought I was going to be ostracized from the group because I was going to be exposed for things. I was, instead of like, realizing the opportunity in front of me which was so amazing i could have moved me forward three or four steps when i was holding myself back like totally unbeknownst to me of what i was doing mm -hmm. when you look back on like whether it's it's the the decision to um to sort of make the leap from uh the personal trainer to a gym owner and then you know all, all the things necessary for that or something even qu quite small comparatively uh, you know, starting a podcast when you've, when mm -hmm. you don't know, really know what that means. Like, how do you know when you're presented with those things, um, that, okay, I feel this fear, but this is an, this is one of those times that I need to go past it. And how do you know, maybe sometimes you run up against that and you think, okay, this is actually telling me something. I need to maybe take a step back and yeah. maybe this isn't the right, uh, maybe this isn't the right decision, or maybe I should say no to that instead of yes to it. Okay. So when you feel fear, it's hard to say. When you feel fear, <laughs> why is it so hard? Um, what's happening is your body is shifting out of the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest. That's what they call it, right? Yep. It's like um, where you're relaxed, where your body can like do its normal functions into the fight or flight, which is elevated heart rate. What happens when you do that is you get, um, along with like increased heart rate and um, adrenaline and the hormones to get you to either like run away or fight off the bad guy um you get a pit in your stomach mm -hmm. and, like you get this feeling right like someone's like like right now imagine like someone's like i'd like you to go up and present to 300 people that are experts in this field that you know not don't know much about and i want you to it's like right away you get this kind of like feeling in your stomach that's your that's your gut feeling it's like they literally call it your gut feeling mm -hmm. when you run up against that thing i would listen to your gut like it's one of the things that I feel like um, is actually fairly good inside of me. I feel like for entrepreneurs, um, we might not be the most book smart, but we have good um, street smarts and we can rely on our gut feelings fairly well. And it's one of those things I would suggest, my suggestion is when you come up against those things, now that you know, particularly now that you know the difference between the, the bodily harm and being ostracized from the group, figure out which of those two things is causing the harm. And then from there, make a decision based off your gut feeling. And if it's like the jerk example, I'm going to put 300 pounds above my head. I've never done more than 245. I have this feeling that this is not a good idea. Listen to your feeling. Mm -hmm. Or I, you're pre presented with an opportunity to speak in front of 300 experts, Fortune 500 executives that could really move your career forward. But you're afraid of being exposed for not being the expert that they think you, that you are. That's the other feeling. So now that you have that gut feeling from that, recognize what it's stemming from. Is it stemming from the bodily harm or this feeling of being ostracized from the group? If it's ostracized from the group, you got to move past that one. That's the ones to move past. That's the ones to figure out how do I use this fear to motivate me to move in the direction of my dreams and my visions and my goals. If you can do that, then you kind of figured out like, ooh, there's a fork in the road. Mm -hmm. I know which when to take which fork. Mm -hmm. 
if that makes any sense. Yeah. And then so when you recognize that or you make that decision, you say, okay, this fear is, uh, um, I, I want to say irrelevant, but that's not the right word. But this fear is, is, is on some degree, it's lying to me, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, right? I, I, yeah. So when you recognize that, how do you then move forward past it? Because that's not an, that's often not enough. Like you can say, okay, yep, this this fear isn't real. It's just my it's okay. just my you know evolution kicking in. Then what? Like how do you then move in that direction? So um, you say it's not enough. I disagree. I think it is enough. Okay. What you really now now major because it's just it's like we've talked about it for you know forty five seconds so far. Mm-hmm. So we haven't like owned it yet. Right, right, right. When you own it, it is. Now here's the example of that. Um, there's really interesting new research out there about stress. So stress is just another form of fear, right? Yep. Stress is like, I'm not, oh my God, I have a big presentation due. Yep. Oh my God, I, I'm not gonna be ready for it. I'm a, like, oh my God, like I'm gonna be late for the meeting. Yep. Like it's just like- Yeah, Tony Robbins says that st- stress is just the the achiever word for fear. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, it's so great. <laughs> okay, so we have stress and we have fear as the same thing. Yeah. There's new um, research out there. This is fascinating stuff that, um, they took a group of people, a very big, big group of people. So it's not a small, it's not like we took nine people. And yeah. um, it, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's a huge group of people. And they asked them, how much stress did you experience in the last year? Little, moderate, high. And then they follow those people for the next five years to figure out who had the most likelihood of dying, right? And to no one's surprise, right? Mm-hmm. The group that experienced the least amount of stress had the, were the healthiest and people that had the highest level of stress die the most but they asked the second question as well which was how much stress have you experienced in the last year the second question was do you believe that stress is bad for you Hmm. and the amazing thing is the people that believed that stress was bad for them no surprise were the highest to die but the people that experienced the highest levels of stress but believed it was not unhealthy were as healthy as people that experienced no stress at all. Hmm. The way you think about things, the way you conceptualize them, the way you respond to them, the way you figure out what's happening in my body actually dictates the markers of what happens in your body. Now, here's the example. I kind of talked about when you get in that fight or flight state. What happens is when you get in that fight or flight state, if you believe stress is bad for you, your veins, your arteries actually constrict. They actually shrink up much like they would if you had um, like coronary heart disease, hmm. which is what people die from. Heart attacks, they constrict. Not if blood gets through, your heart convulses and you die. What's interesting is the people that felt that stress was not bad for them, their arteries didn't change at all. Hmm. So then what happens is their heart is beating faster and more blood is going to the organs and the muscles that need to be doing it. They're bringing waste product away, more oxygen and Uh, blood is going to their brain, they have better cognitive function, which makes total sense. Think about an athlete before a really big event. Do you think they're just like totally chill? Or do you think that the event itself, there's a reason people PR at big events, right? There's a a reason that world records are not set in training Mm -hmm. because the stress of the event actually improves their performance because those elite athletes know this feeling is getting me ready. It's not anxiety in my stomach I'm feeling, it's readiness. I'm getting ready for this event. I am in a heightened state. I am basically Bradley Cooper and limitless, right? Mm -hmm. I have greater cognitive function. I can read and react faster. And literally this is what happens. Everything is heightened and you are a better ready state. So it's the thought process that we, it's not (laughs) stress that kills us. It's being stressed about being stressed yeah. that kills us. Yep. It's how we place meaning on those things. Mm-hmm. So if we can place meaning on, let's go back to the first one, of um, I am feel I fear fear because I'm going to be ostracized. If you can relabel that as this is going to get me more prepared, more ready, I'm going to be um, I'm going to be able to pre- present better because of this. It just reframes everything. It's a reframing process that helps you out the most. Um, do you do you have a sense of where or when you started to make that flip in your head? Like, was it uh, just the, uh, sort of a natural evolution of things you were reading, things you were paying attention to, things you were thinking about? Um, do you remember nice. yeah. like when it started to be, go from even just like an intellectual, like I understand that this fear isn't, you know, yeah. quote unquote real to like good? 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Do you um, remember when that happened? A few things. Uh, tip to kind of tip that for me. Um, first was uh, Carol Dweck's mindset. Mm -hmm. So it's really that difference. It's like I lived in this fixed mindset of, of if you're in a fixed mindset, you believe that um, the cards you were dealt are what you're going to be dealing with your whole life. And you're going to spend every opportunity very urgently trying to prove that you measure up. As opposed to if you have a growth mindset, which is like, here's the cards I was dealt. That's the starting point for development. And because I had a fixed mindset, it was like, I'm just looking for all these areas that I need to excel in. And it's not like I can get better at it. I'm going to need to, if I if I can't pass the test, I don't want to take the test. Right. So that's a really fearful place to live your entire life because you have no place to go but up. That was kind of the first one. And, you know, only read that probably three, four years ago. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I spent the first 36 <laughs> years of my life yeah. in a different state. Um but even before that, it was coaching athletes and seeing things and seeing what they were afraid of and why they were afraid and um, how that fear was either helping or hindering. Um, the next one was um, that uh, that realization of like it stems from us living in tribal yep. societies, uh, you know, outside of caves. That's from Seth Godin. Um, and I learned that yep. listening to him. I think he calls uh, it the lizard brain. Oh, very cool. I think, yep. I think that's what he Yeah, lizard brain is a, is a very common term for any yep. sort of like that... Uh, ancestral like yep. caveman type thing yep um and then you know there's been a few other kind of things that have brought it to light but it's really it's kind of just being around it and seeing it firsthand um in terms of like working with athletes that come into the gym every day afraid mm -hmm. right afraid of being exposed afraid of not doing well and what you realize is like I know you're afraid that like you're gonna be laughed at for not being able to do double unders. I know you're gonna be you're afraid that you're gonna be laughed at for finishing last. I know you're afraid. Guess what? Like nobody cares. <laughs> like I can't. I like yeah. nobody cares. We're all wrapped up in our own shit. Yep. Like I, I don't swear on this podcast. I, know, I, I think know, that was the first. I don't one. know why I just did that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't swear anyway. It's not the podcast. Um, but we're all wrapped up in our own stuff it's yeah. like it's we're all like we're all so self-consumed with the own our own thoughts and our own fears and our own desires and our own um idiosyncrasies and our own like daily to do's like we're so like we are not we don't really care what you do man mm -hmm. it's and once you realize that it, like it takes so much pressure off yeah so an example of that is i came into the gym this morning and we're doing this workout that i would do fairly well in and i'd want to do well in but as i'm warming up i'm like man i just don't have it today like you know Patriots on last night, you know, like been up the last few nights, you know, pre preparing for some presentation. I've got a busy couple like things going on in my life right now. Didn't have the opportunity to warm up the way I normally do. Felt a little creakier than normal. Instead of like, oh my gosh, like maybe I should skip this workout because I'm not gonna do as well as I should. Or maybe I should, it's like, I just like scaled the scaled it like crazy mm -hmm. like i like i've never done before i did single unders instead of double unders <laughs> i've done single unders in a workout yeah. in 10 years and it's just like i'm not afraid of like what i look like now yep. i use 95 pounds when everyone's used 135 pounds i did regular burpees when i did bar facing burpees it was like i just didn't i don't it's so i'm i realize what other people are thinking and they're not thinking differently about me because of that mm -hmm. if anything it might even be like a whoa yeah that's like He's bold enough to do what's right for him. He doesn't need to conform. I don't need to be one of the pack. It's like, it just changes your perspective on a lot of things when you realize that people don't really care what about you in that way as much as you think. <laughs> yeah. And um, sort of last question is, is it, it, you sort of just touched on a lot, but it's um, the idea that this isn't something that you figured out once and then you don't have to worry about it again, right? It's something that, uh, crops up and shows up in whatever form it does sort of endlessly, right? Oh man, I, I still like, so um, I'm giving presentations yeah. this weekend and the next weekend. Like I'm the, the fear part of that, when I, even, when I, I, even when I just said those words, I'm giving presentations, I felt my stomach change. Yeah. Like literally feel my stomach change. And it's something you've done. Oh man, I mean, 10, I, I've, 20, done, I've done it, times, I've done 50 it. Times. I've, I mean, I give presentations. I've yeah. given probably a hundred presentations. Yeah. Um, and I've, it's just, it just, it's, it happens, right? Mm -hmm. it's, so that's the fear. And I have to get past that to the point where um, this morning before this podcast, I met with our, um, our marketing director and she um, videotaped one of my presentations and we went through it and she gave me all the feedback and all the critiques of things that I can prove upon. Mm -hmm. 
like just sitting down for that meeting was like, I was like, oh, this is going to be painful. <laughs> this is gonna, I'm afraid of this. Like yeah. call what you want, but it's like, I don't, I'm afraid. But I also really quickly fi- flipped it. And it's like, this is the best thing. This is the way I'm going to improve the most. Like, you know, it's that, you know, if um, the process of giving a TED talk is, they don't just say like, oh, you're an amazing presenter. Why don't you jump up on stage and give your presentation? <laughs> you give it to their panel of half a dozen expert public speakers and they rip you apart. Like just that thought of it by itself is like, yeah. oh, that's so <laughs> like terrible. I'd rather not give a TED yeah, talk. Yeah, I'd rather not give a TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> but you realize, if, and that's what you'd be missing out on is yeah. giving a TED talk as opposed to like, why do I have this fear? Well, the fear is of feedback. Okay, the feedback is I'm fearful of feedback because they're going to give me things I'm not good at. If they tell me things I'm good at, it's because they don't think I'm good enough. They don't think I'm good enough. Am I not going to be part of the tribe, part of the group? Am I going to be pushed out into the woods and I die of exposure? No, you're not. They're going to make you better. Like you just realize you flip it. You mm-hmm. just understand where it's coming from. And if you're able to flip it, it moves you forward, not holding you back or at worst pushing you down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one thing that um, Tim Ferriss gave a TED talk on, ironically, huh? <laughs> uh, on fear setting, um, and I, and it's been a little while since I've watched it, but one of those, which is you just touched on, is one of the parts of that, or one of the parts of a process, is like figure out what's the worst case scenario here. Like, yeah. you give a bad TED talk, what's the worst thing that will happen, and then what can you do to get back to the place you were before that happened? And so it's just the the sort of the self-awareness and the walking through the steps of like, okay, I'm scared. What am I scared of? What does that mean? How can I mitigate it? Like how, like Ted talk, prepare better. Okay. Yep. I, if I prepare better, they will be less likely that I will give a Ted, uh, you know, give a talk that people don't think is impactful, whatever it is. But if you don't like get to the step past, Oh, I, this feels crappy. I'm right. going to avoid it. You can't figure out what it is you're actually scared of, you know? Yeah. When you figure out, um, the, not only the what is you're scared of, but the, the why behind it. Yeah. Like why am I? So the, the worst case scenario, I give a bad TED talk. Okay. Well, if that happens, why is that so bad? Mm-hmm. You know, like, because I'm going to feel, I don't like feedback. It's, I don't like them telling me I'm not good enough. I, okay. Well, that's because you have a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. So if you have a growth mindset, they give you feedback. That's the best opportunity you have to improve. Literally, you have half a dozen of the best coaches on public speaking in the world giving you feedback. What's the problem with that? Well, I don't like it. <laughs> well, okay, then. Okay, yeah. you have a fixed mindset and you don't like it. Even though you don't like something, is it a great opportunity for you to grow and improve? Yes. Okay. Check the box. Let's move past the fear. Yeah. Awesome. Leave it there. In the next episode of Chasing Excellence. Um, of those three components, I believe the biggest differentiator amongst all of those is for a master's athlete. If you have to pick one, um, I think it's skills. Just search for Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. And thanks.